we have a time difference zone. Okay, uh, here in Brazil it's quite early. So, uh, my name is Miguel Anjosa, you can see that. Uh, I'm service supervisor here in Dynapak Latam, and today we are going to talk about a bit uh, about compaction rotors theory and application. So I will start in a couple of more minutes, but we have to wait for more people to get online so that they can see the video. I will give them, I think, one or two minutes so we can start in the to talk about this topic. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, second, please, if you want to leave a comment or message, do it in the chat. I can, I'm reading the chat, so any questions you have, I will try to answer during the presentation. Otherwise, uh, we will have a section for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. And then we will, I, I will try or maybe uh, answer all your the, the information, all the questions you may have. Okay. So in order to leave a uh, message in the chat, in case you don't have uh, access, you have to create an account. Not having a Gmail account is not enough to leave a message. You have to create a YouTube account. So it just links your Gmail account with the with the account from the YouTube. So you just try to write, and it will show up. Uh, it will pop up some indications so you can register and share these uh, comments. So anyway, uh, today I will try to explain a bit of theory of compaction. Not exactly I'm going to talk about vibration or I'm going to go out, uh, talk about frequency, how it works, how it works, because we already have some workshops about, about that. Uh, but we are going to go in the theory of the compaction, where how it works and how uh, it comes afterward, how the application comes and how it's affected by the machines and how do we do our job. And I will also uh, add some tips about application. So I think I have given two minutes to everyone. So I think we are ready. I'm going to start with the presentation. So yes, uh, let's go for compaction, theory and application, of course. And now we're going into, first we're going to start with soil compaction. Okay, when talking about soil compaction, uh, we have to start with the road construction. What, what is soil compaction? First, we will have a machine that will move the earth, of course. It will move the material, uh, make a mixture of the material, be sure the, the material is mixed, and then we are going to level it up so that all the material is uh, available, is at the same level or of height of material but then we are going to compact it and for this purpose we have a compaction roller and this compaction roller of course will have these different uh, features depending of the type of material we are going to compact so we can have uh, a smooth cylinder roller correct or we can have a pad, uh, a pad roller, with a roller with pad shells also we can have a tamping roller. So depending on the material where we are going to work, we can have either of them. And they can be, e you, you have to choose on the application you will, you, you have to do work with, the material you have to work with. And you also have some sizes according, for example, in, the, in these two machines, we will have uh, bigger machines and you will be working with uh, maybe material with bigger particles. So we will talk about uh, a bit more about this in in, a, in another slide. So uh, just to remember, it's like every time we're working with a material, we have to select the correct machine. So first, what of what what is compaction? What what compaction? What do we do with the compaction? We use mechanical forces to uh, increase the density of the material by removing the air voids that is trapped in the material. So what we usually do here is we're going to use, a, in, in the case of our rollers, uh, vibrate, vibratory rollers, we are going to vibrate and we are, are going to accommodate the particles. And this way, we are going to remove the air and at the same time, we are going to increase the density of the material. The higher the density, the higher the load it will uh, sustain. But it's important to mention that here in soil compaction, the water is working like a lubrication and it allows the material to not uh, to 
sleep through it and accommodate itself. So that is compaction. But in compaction, in soul compaction, we have three parameters that we can conveniently uh, control to influence in the property of the material we are compacting. So which are these properties? First one is the effect of the water content in the soil to be compacted as a moisture level. So the quantity of water we have in the material, uh, is, it can be affected by us, by, well, by the laboratory actually, but also us. So we can have control of this. And what's the, uh, the next step is the effect of the compaction effort, meaning the machine and also the, the number of passes we are going to use here. Uh, the number of passers we, we will have here and also the effect of the compaction type and here we will talk exactly about that machine type we're using which uh, if we are going to use a tamping machine if we are going to use a vibratory machine or even a static machine so so these ones are the the three factors that we could uh, work with so once again we go into the effect of the water contact in the soil to be compacted the first one. So we already seen the what is compaction and we are going to move the water. But here comes the first uh, theoretical information that we are going to work with. And this is, uh, this is very well known. This is the proctor, correct? Um, what, do we, what do we work with here? It's like we, need, we have a dry material, but to reach the maximum uh, density of the material and of course the maximum load it can sustain we are going to add water so every time we add water uh, we are reaching more and more density the higher we go in water we are going to reach up to one point where we had the higher or the highest density point and if we continue add, adding water we will lose a stability of the material so this way we're talking if we are not in the optimum location in the optimum quantity of water we are dry of optimum and if we have too much material we are wet of optimum so these two factor uh, well this factor of the content of of water is the most important you will have in soil so we, we have to be aware of this um, and how to understand this one so we were talking about proctor uh you know proctor is uh, was an engineer that in the 1930s actually I think it's 1933 if not uh, mistaken that did some tests and he was like I need uh, I want to use the maximum energy to compact the material and how this will affect the material and how, how how if I add different quantities of water in during the test I will reach a higher level or density of the material so what he did first was the standard proctor that we all know but in the second world war uh, we have bigger machines and we have more load for the compaction for the roads so he was like i have to do a new a new test so he modified the test and this is uh, this test is the modified proctor that includes more weight uh, more energy actually because you are dropping the, the, the weight from a higher position and you have five layers here of material and the same quantity of impacts so the height and the, and the weight are going to create more more energy and he uh, and well with this test we can use less water and reach a higher density of material uh, but you also need more energy but here is, is something interesting to see in this picture like we have here uh, the standard proctor and we have the modified proctor so when we're talking the standard and modified you can see that at the beginning when you have a low quantity of material you need more uh, you will have more energy maybe uh, energy but you will reach more um, density but while you have more uh, material or, or you will need more 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 water to reach the highest point here but afterwards if you continue adding water you won't see that much difference in, in, in between bo the both uh, being a, a modified proctor or a standard proctor so you will have almost a similar behavior if you continue adding water and this test is very well known Th this test is usually 
what we can see in the field. This is something that uh, I, I would like to give you uh, some comments about. Um, well, hopefully you can see me now. And yeah, what I wanted to share here is that usually when you're in the field, and I, and I talk this from the exper experience I have in the field with the operators and with the technicians, with the field technicians, they usually speak about how, why the customer talks about the standard, when do they talk about modified proctor, and how they can work it, and how it, it actually affects the material we're working with. So we, we need this information to understand that the customer is doing a different compaction for a different application. So when we're talking about modified proctor, they are maybe working in a high road, or they are working with uh, um, an airport. And when they are talking with a standard proctor, they are doing maybe a, a park or a urban area that they don't need that much compaction because the higher the compaction you go through, the higher the energy is because you are going to have more load over the material you have compacted. So it's important to understand uh, from the point of view of the customer, what's the project they are working with, what's the actually the, the, the objective of the work they are uh, are doing before uh, we are going to offer the, not only the machine but we are going to do the test and the number of passes and that way we can ensure the best quality of compacted material then continuing here something I wanted to share this is more like a field method to understand when you have reached the moisture level or the correct moisture level um, actually when you are uh, working in the field and you can find the material this is loosened material not compacted yet you can see here the roller is about to go in front of it you can make a ball in your hand like a like um, a snowball you know it's, uh, it's quite a small the, the side of your hand and you can drop it in um, a smooth surface uh, already compacted surface of a height of 1.5 meters and depending on the behavior of how it breaks you, you can be you can analyze so you can understand how is the material ready if it breaks for example in several particles and you can see it very dry particles you are aware that uh, this is too dry okay the, you have too many too much particles they, they are spread around you so this is too much uh, this is too dry well uh, when this one breaks in two or three pieces then you can say this material is close to or, or is very close to the optimum content of water that you expect the material to have um, then if it doesn't uh, break it actually deforms like you have a ball of mud uh, it deforms when it in impacts the floor then you are aware that this has too much water and why do I share this information because actually when you are in the field and, and uh, this is something that I've seen quite uh, some 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 tests that I, I participated is like the material is left there close to the job site um, it can it can be a warm day that you can have 25 degrees well here in, in, in Latin American countries this that's quite warm and then it can go up to 40s 40 45 degrees and the material starts starts drying and then you will have this this difference in the in the in the behavior of the material actually it, if, if it stays too long there you will dry it will dry out and then you will have some issues while compacting so uh, when I was uh, for example in this case I was looking into it and I was working with uh, I was doing some commission here with the uh, operator and asking how the machine was behaving and everything um, he was mentioning that there was too much preparation of the machine when he was doing the 10 passes the the 10th pass so I just check on the material first I, I was not sure if the 10 passes was more than enough maybe but what I checked was also the material the material was quite dry so I recommended them that not to leave the material too long exposed to the Sun because it was drying too much the material and of course this was affecting the, the compaction that they wanted to reach and once we were talking about like the what we can do with the moisture driver with the energy we're using now we move to the effect of compaction then we can work with vibratory compaction or we can use tamping compaction 
Okay, uh, we know that vibratory compaction is talking about um, the frequency and the amplitude we use in the comp uh, in the roller, and in tapping compaction we are talking about the uh, the impact that you can see here in the video, the impact that it's creating every time a path shell uh, hits the material. And here you will talk about speed, and here we will talk about uh, the weight and the frequency and the amplitude. So, general rules for application, here we have what we call coarse soil or cohesive soil. And it depends on what you are going to use, what material you have, and you will choose the material. This is something that I mentioned at the beginning. So, depending on the type of material we are going to compact, we have to choose the machine. So, as a general rule, if we are going to talk about clay compaction, that that's the most finest material we can find, uh, you have to use a, a cylinder with pad shells. So, you actually will, will, will have some... Um, you, can, uh, uh, you, you can actually have some uh, CA, what we have, the CA 5500PD 5, or the CA 6500PD. But when talking with clay, when working with clay, uh, what we actually work with more here in, the, in South America is a CT machine. It's a fully compact uh, tamping machine. And this one will uh, works at high speed and will compact by impact material. So this is, these are the machines that you can use, of course. But then again, this one is uh, the best materials you can, uh, well, the, the machines that you should use for this kind of material. Of course, we can also have a uh, bigger particle size, and then we're talking about lime. Lime material, you can use a CA or PDE, or a CA3500 PDE, or a CT machine. Um, and here, you are still use a PDE, or a patch shell uh, cylinder, because you are still needing, this is a small particle, and you still need impact force to reach a certain compaction level. And the higher, the, 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 the bigger the particle, we are moving to different machines. So now, for example, if we are going to compact rubber, gravel and sand, uh, we are talking about uh, bigger particles, so we use a small, a smooth cylinders. And these ones, depending on the size of the particle, we are going to use a bigger machine. So we can go from a uh, CA15, uh, well, 150 to a CA25 or 2500, and then we can use a CA2800. And the bigger the particle, the bigger we should use the machine. Um, we have particles up to 12 centimeters or, or 10 centimeters, and we can go up to a CA4000. But when, when we are talking about the boulder compaction, and we have rock the sizes of 15 centimeters, we should go into CA5000 or CA6500 that are the biggest machines and, and we even have a bigger one that is the CA702 if not mistaken still uh, manufacture this machine but these are for bigger bigger boulders so depending on the material we are compacting we are going to use uh, different sizes of machines okay so what parameters are we going to use um, when we are talking about vibration? And here are some tips of what we usually talk when we are talking about vibration or vibratory machines. So one of the questions we usually receive in the field is if a 15-ton machine is better than a 12-ton machine. Actually, the first question we have to make them is, what makes or what is the one responsible of the compaction? So in this X-ray view of the machine, we can see that we have the engine and we have the pump and it, uh, we have flow, oil flow here and it reaches the eccentric. Um, when you are working with uh, uh, an eccentric, this is the one responsible of the force or the how high the cylinder is going to jump and then the energy that is going to impact in the in the in the material because it's the, it's not only the weight that jumps but in the end when it completes the full 
the full rotation, it would help also to impact the material. So actually, all the work, all the job is done in the front module. Okay, so all the front module is the one responsible of making this uh, compaction here. So you have to understand which one is responsible first. So it doesn't matter you have a 15 ton machine and if this one is 5 ton and this one here is 10 ton. Because if you have a 15 ton, a 12 ton machine that you can have here 5 ton and here in the back 7 ton, and it makes the same, uh, it actually can make the same job because you have 5 ton in the, uh, at the front. But then you have to analyze how is the energy here from the eccentric to make these works uh, to help this level of compaction. So you have to be aware this this is usually a question we receive in the field when we're talking about uh, which is the one responsible I want to buy a bigger machine I didn't want to buy this machine because this is uh, this uh, this is not 15 ton or 16 ton and and then you have to explain them where it where is the information what is working what is doing the compaction in the soil and another question that we have is in operation usually is if they have to deactivate the vibration when they are uh, in reverse because you know a pass is you move forward and you move backwards that's one pass so you move to from point a to, prom to point b and they are using vibration and when moving from point b to, pro to point a they are not using vibration at all so when you talk about that uh, you ask them why are not you why are you not using vibration and it's because they have years doing the same thing and when you explain them that one pass is going I I with vibration at all time, they can see that they need less passes to do their job. Um, this is something we have to see with operators. Many of them are not that much skilled. Um, they need constant support from our side and they need uh, constant information, training that we can provide. Another question is if they should change the amplitude when they change the direction. Actually, you don't need to change the, uh, the amplitude when you're working. And something I, uh, we have discovered somehow is like when we are talking about compaction and they use high amplitude at all time, they actually stay at high amplitude until the machine vibrates too much. It's like uh, they stop the vibration by two motives. The first one is like the machine starts yapping so the direction it by itself moves slightly to the right or to the left. Then they know the material is compacted. And then, of course, they think, uh, no, I still have to do, because they have told me I have to do 10 passes or 15 passes. So I am already at 10 and the machine is jumping. Then I will reduce the amplitude. So now I can continue the other five passes that I have to do. So this way, they, continue, they just change the amplitude that way. They won't change it otherwise. But this was one question and I wanted to mention so we could talk about, about, about a bit about uh, amplitude, how it works and when we should change it. Um, of course, one another question if we can vary the speed. And when we are talking about varying the speed, actually the machine goes forward 5 km per hour, backwards 5 km per hour. You don't need that much difference. You can go, uh, the difference is that you have a potentiometer in the joystick, so when you move forward, you are accelerating. You, you are per the perception of acceleration, but actually you should just yes, move forward or move, move backwards and you will have five and five. What happens if you go slower? Um, uh, what we will see later is the frequency the cylinder hits the material that it's around, let's say, the CA uh, to, uh, 2500. It goes to 33 impacts per second. So this is calculated that you will go five kilometers per hour, so it will hit in different spots the material. So if you are actually not doing this, you will impact more times in the same spot because you are going very slow. Uh, they say, no, if I go slower, I can reach the compact level, compaction degree I want faster, but actually you can do it slower because you need more time to reach this compaction level. And of course, the a second um, uh, condition that happens here is that as you are impacting too much times in the same spot, you can over compact the material. So some places you have more compaction level than others. 
So this is something that should be evaluated in the field. And of course, we have tools that we um, uh, 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 that can be, for example, the uh, compaction meter or the dynalyzer that can help us not to think about how to do we control this here. So using technology is good, but we should also understand what's behind this technology because what happens most of the time if we go into the field, we explain this to the operators and then two things can, can happen. One, we leave the job site and the operator does whatever he was doing before we arrived. Or two, they will just change the operator the following day because operators are easily replaceable for to say, this is wrong to say, of course, but they sometimes they do not agree. No, you know, have more experience in this machine. So you go there and I, you want to start with uh, operation, then I put you here. So this uh, mixture of what we do with the operator uh, can change uh, all day. I, I happened to do a commissioning. I went there four days, three days explaining one operator of how to work with a paper. And the last day they changed the operator. And I have to start again and I only had one day to do the training. So this can happen. So it's important to understand what is going on in the field. Okay. Uh, I can see that I have a couple of questions in the chat. Please leave your questions in the chat box. Uh, the end of if I have not answered it uh, during the explanation, I will have a time by the end of the um, uh, of the of this training of this workshop, and I will try to answer all the questions that are are, are left there. So please don't worry if I, I don't answer it right now. I will try to answer it at the end of the of the workshop. Uh, what else we have here? Some important information we have is like you have the technical information. And this is a theoretical information we have available in our web page. So you can go into our web page and you can find the information of the machine. But which values should we consider when we are comparing a machine or when we are studying which is, uh, which is the best or more suitable option to work with? So usually, well, I have added here the, the frequency or the centrifugal force formula because this is a, a information that it's already included and calculated by our engineering department. So you don't have to do the math, but of course you have there the values and you can do the math yourself. But another value that is important is the weight. Uh, in, in the case of a smooth uh, cylinder rollers, we are going to talk about the weight of the front module. As I was saying before, this is the one responsible of doing the job. So you have to know how much weight it has. Um, then you have to see what is the width of the cylinder because you, you have to compare this one too. And when you have these both two values, you can actually calculate what's the static linear load. And this is a value that is also shown in, in, in the information we share in our web page. Then what additional information can we share with you that you can find? Uh, we have some information about the maximum recommended thickness or layer thickness that the machine can compact. But once again, this is theoretical information. So this means the machine can do this, but w meaning that the machine can do doesn't mean that you should do. Okay. And here, for example, the first I, I took the, the example, the gravel and uh, the multigraded, the machine can do up to 50 centimeters of compaction. Okay. But then you have to understand that the, ma the same material you, according to the project, you will have different proctor values that you have to work with. If you are in a park, you're talking the long, it's only going to be long, then you are going to 90 and you can use this 92 reference. But if you are going to a urban area where you are doing some road, then you are going to go to 95% of proctor uh, of compaction. And if you go into an airport, you can go higher than 98. You can have up to 100 or 102, I don't know. Depends on the project specifications that you will have on site. And this is you have to this you have to discuss with the customer because they are the only ones who know what we need or what do they need in the field. So here you have this information and you know, for example, for a 95 uh, proctor, modified proctor, uh, medium compaction of 95%. You need uh, for the 50 centimeters, you need 10 passes. So you are aware that you need 10 passes. 
uh, do you actually do the 10 passes? This is a number that is uh, obtained from the field experience of everyone from, from, from Dynapack, I think. And this is a, a very close number to the number of passes you will need, but it doesn't mean you will reach with 10 passes. You might be able to reach it with 8 passes or with 12 passes. So this is something that you have to experience in the field. Or you can also use the technology you have at hand, like the compaction meter or the dynalyzer, to help you understand which is the numbers of passes you have or, or you have to work with. Um, what parameters you use for tamping compaction? Now talking about tamping. So first, we have to understand what does the compaction or which is responsible of the compaction. So we were aware that the pad shells in the cylinder are the ones responsible of the compaction. But what is the one, what is responsible of this? This is the higher the speed, the stronger the heat. So what is more important here is what speed you have. Okay, what, what is the higher speed you will reach? So if we're talking about speed, what is the best compaction speed? Here you can have a number like 18 to 20 kilometers per hour, but is this the highest it can go? Actually, no, it can go higher. You have machines that can, that can say that you can go up to 30 kilometers per hour, but do they actually work at 30 kilometers per hour? One experience we had here with our machines, uh, because this machine has been tested, uh, Marcos Bueno, that is our ser uh, product specialist in, in, in here in Brazil, he did the test in in Paraguay, okay, and he reached in some parts up to more than 20 kilometers per hour. Um, this was quite fast, and you could even compare to other brands, and we were faster. But why? Because you know when when the machine starts rolling and it starts hitting the material, you also have the bouncing effect. So the bouncing effect is going to hit back to the machine. And this impact that creates into machine creates vibration. So the machine itself vibrates because of the engine and the materials and the movement, you will have some vibration. But the higher speed you have, the higher vibration you will feel in the cabin. So the operator will start having too much vibration and they themselves will uh, study if they have to go slower, actually. So with our machine, with the CT3000, we can reach uh, 20 kilometers per hour without any vibration issues. So this is something we have to share with our customers, of course, uh, because we, we are aware that all machines say, no, you can do up to 30 kilometers per hour, but yeah, test it on the field test it there and see, feel, let the operator feel how my, much vibration it's getting up to the cabin. And this will definitely make uh, another time of decision. And of course, we also have some compact, uh, compaction information. Um, this is also shared in our web page. If you don't have uh, the information, you can ask your uh, distribution uh, distributor, your dealer, or you can ask us as Dynapack and we can share you this information. And here what we can see is like if we're going to use this, we can use it in sealed or clay. And I took clay like an example. And you can see here that it can reach 30 centimeters, correct? But can you actually compact 30 centimeters? Uh, centimeters? You, you have to go deeper actually. You have to go you, you should work with 25. What we reach in this experience that Marcos Bueno, uh, you can contact him also uh, for more information about this test. He was uh, there in the field and in, with working with 25 centimeters, he was doing an, an ice job. He was going 20 or up more than 20 kilometers per hour and he was reaching an ice compaction. Of course, you say that's too many passes. You are talking about 24 passes against another machine that can do the job maybe in 10, 12 passes. Yeah, but what about the speed? What about the speed you need to do this job and the fuel consumption you will have? So actually, uh, when we're talking about clay compaction or seal compaction, you can save more by using this kind of machine, of a tamping machine, than using a smooth rotor machine for this kind of compaction. But of course, uh, I, and I think this here is one of the the questions we received from Vicky Sanch, like uh, which machine was used, sandy soil and road project. 
So you have to understand what's the quantity of the, or, or you have to study the material and see how much sand you have, how much clay you have, because it's a mixture actually. All, all, most of the time it's a mixture of different materials, what, are you, what you are going to have on the field. Um, in, in this study, you have to take this to the proctor test that we saw at the beginning, and then you will see what's the level of compaction you will need and how, mu how much energy maybe you can calculate, how much energy you will, you will need. So the more quantity of sand or, or, or small grains you will have, if it has more than 35%, if not mistaken, you will have to work with the tamping machine. Uh, if you have more uh, coarse material, like uh, coarse particles, rocks, small rocks, then you will use a smooth uh, cylinder. So it's important to study the material that, that we are going to use before uh, deciding what type of machine we're going to use. Um, something I've been talking about is the compaction degree and how do we measure it? In the field you can find different tests, actually the most known I would say is here the nuclear device that will measure the, uh, the compaction degree and they will, oh, they will show you the density of the material, uh, the, uh, you, you will have a value, but which, uh, how do you compare this one, with what do you compare this one? Well actually you have to compare it to the proctor, be it modified with standard proctor you measured in the lab. So you have the maximum dry density of the material that uh, what they do is actually they will take this sample that was hit several times, they will put it on an oven for a whole day at 60 degrees and the next day is completely dry and they will weigh the material and they will know how much weight you have. And what they do here, if not using the nuclear device, uh, be it the cone or of the core sample, they will take this sample and they will dry it again in the oven for in at 60 degrees for a whole day and then they will weigh this material and then they will compare it. And when they compare it, they will find, eh, yeah, this material reaches uh, dish, mass, uh, dish mass dry density and I will compare it to the value I have in the lab and multiply it by 100 and then you have the value in a percentage value. So this is actually how you are, when you are talking about compaction degree, this is how they do it in the field. And they have different tests in the field. You can even have in the field that they start um, warming up the material in the field and they do a, a, a very fast compa comparison test in the field to understand how many particles go through uh, a grid and then they can compare and they, they have different tests to do in the field. But actually what they do is they work with the material, they take it to the lab, they search for the highest uh, dry density or the highest density they can reach and then they compare it to the values you have in the field. So once you have these values and now you are aware of what you have to do, then you have to understand what's the number of passes you're going to work with. So actually this one is a uh, picture from, from Marcos that he shared. Um, for this one, when you are not using, I would say technology like the compaction meter and you, or even using that one, you need to know how many passes you have to work with. So actually, you have to understand what's the compaction degree that the customer needs. And first of all, you also have to, the information from the manufacturer or how many passes you should do to reach this certain compaction degree. And of course, if you find like, uh, I have to do 10 passes or 12 passes, I don't know, then you have a number. And then you should start like two passes before. Like, I will start measuring each pass after, if I need 10 passes, at the eighth pass, I will start measuring the compaction degree. So then I will start recording each and every pass to understand how much compaction I have achieved with every pass. So it's important here to understand this one because if you don't save the information, then you have no comparison number. And then you with the doing this two or three times, you have some average information. Then you are aware that you need maybe nine passes to 10 passes to reach that compaction degree. And with this, you can actually uh, compare it also with the compaction meter that can be mounted in the machine or with any, another technology you are using with your machine. Okay, so this is actually uh, the field test you, you should do in the field to avoid many uh, application issues because uh, for in another slide that we show what could happen, okay? So do we have another alternative, another option to do this? Yeah, you can use the compaction meter 
uh, this is you have installed a mounted an accelerometer in the cylinder and it will just measure the bouncing effect in the machine and it will show you some numbers and it will let you know when you have reached uh, in this display when you have reached the level compaction and you have to choose then you have to select according to the material uh, you have se to select different measure levels but uh, besides this uh, you can also start with the test because then you are aware that yeah the compaction meter is showing me the, the correct numbers of, of passes that I should work with but what happens if we go to over compaction because this is a, a term that is not usually welcomed by the customer because uh, it means that they have done some uh, they are not doing a, a well job but it actually happens and here these numbers uh, this this is an actual uh, information I got from the field from my first experience with compaction in my first experience with compaction was with uh, a rammer you know these these small machines that you can use for trench compaction um, what we received from the customer it was like this is for a park um, the app you can work between 90 to 95 percent of compaction degree we don't need more than that if you are between uh, 90 and 95 it's fine uh, okay and how many passes do you work with and they said 15 passes with fi 15 passes we are sure that we have arrived to a certain a certain value that will ensure uh, a nice uh, compaction degree so here what we actually are looking at and, and you can see in this uh, in this information is like what we did in the field is we start uh, compacting material so what I did was the same thing I looked for the manufacturing information and our Dynapack information and look how many passes do I need and it said like six to seven passes so I was aware that between six to seven passes I could reach 90 to 95 percent of compaction degree uh, yes uh, and afterwards we were looking into they do 15 passes so what we're looking is we put from uh, they were doing of course different uh, a, a not a correct compaction as I mentioned before you go up from one point to one point A to point B and from point B to point A and then you are uh, you all the time are vibrating with the machine and you don't have to do any different uh, movement so they were good doing six of movement and it was not correct so we had to fix first the compaction application or the compaction way they were working with afterwards what we were looking into were the number of passes so I said okay six is the, le the least number of passes I need to reach 90 to 95 percent of compaction so I started recording since pass number four so with pass number four we were a bit above 85 percent with pass number five we were already in 90 percent with pass number six we were actually already very close to 95 percent so the operator told me well this is done we shouldn't do any more and I told him, wait a minute, they told me you do 15 passes every day, is, it that, is that right? Yes, then we should continue. So we recorded each and every of the passes in the material. So what we were doing here, you can see is like, they were, we were recording all the passes that we were working with. So when we reached the, the pass number eight, we have already achieved almost 100% of compaction degree. And then it broke again, the material loses the stability and it goes down and then you have to uh, start compaction uh, and they start compacting the material again because the material is broken so it's loosened so it doesn't doesn't have that much compaction so they will start compacting it again it goes up again and then it goes down and every time we go up and we go down we are that the compaction degree you are managing it could move even the water up to the surface of the material so you cannot reach the same degree of compaction so you won't get up to the highest level again that you had a reach before so even though we could have a stop at 10 passes maybe because it was already proved our point that they were breaking material and they were compacting it again we did the 15 passes and we ob what we obtained from this was like uh, the customer was claiming first 
I forgot to mention this one. Uh, the machine is breaking, everything is falling apart. This is a quality issue. The bolts are breaking. The there are lifting points are breaking. The engine is breaking. You have many features in, in the features in, in, in the components. Uh, yeah, but why was this happening? So we took the, the the experiment to the to the job site and we found this. So actually, when you have done six or seven passes, you were already done. You didn't need to do anything else. But they continue doing this. So these additional eight passes were harmful to the machine because you have here the bouncing effect so they will the machine the energy you were heating the material with was coming back to the machine and creating vibration and vibration can sometimes reach to oscill um, to, to, to much oscillation the machine and it could break okay so what we find here you can find it also in bigger machines so what can happen you can be harmful for the machine. So actually when it breaks here with the shock absorbers, these ones are working all the time, absorbing all the impacts. So this work works like a fuse in an electrical system. So once it breaks, you know you have to change them. Um, one tip here, or one comment here, usually we all know that you don't have to, you don't change one, you change all the side, or maybe you change all the elements. But uh, what do I do with the ones that didn't break? Actually, many times when even if we tell to our customers that they should have a complete kit of the shock absorbers in their stock, they don't do this. They usually have the, they usually buy it in the last minute, it broke, I buy it. Uh, so what we recommend when these are um, construction customers that we have, that they can save the, well, the broken ones you replace, you replace the whole side and you, f you stay with the kit you change the whole kit and you stay with the, the ones that are not broken because they are still already they have loosened some of the the because it's very solid when it arrives when it's quite new it's very very solid but when it starts working it will loosen so if it breaks again another one you just change this one with a loosened one so you can wait for the new parts uh, you can order and you don't have the machine stop for that long you can start working, you just replace with a loosened one, you can continue working. But another thing that we can find here with, uh, with too many passes is like, uh, you can even damage the cylinder. Uh, when you damage the cylinder here, for example, you can see that here, you, it was not only the number of passes, but actually below, you can see the rocks were quite big. So, this is something that you have to see in the in the job site. You have to see what they are doing and correct what they are doing. You have to do the recommendations because this way your customer learns and you can show the machine can do more. Okay. So here you can see that it was deformed and it was severely well I don't have the, the other the, the other image, but it was quite damaged, the cylinder. Um, talking about cylinders. One question we usually have is when do we change it? Uh, usually when you ask the customer uh, what's the thickness of the material, they usually measure very close to the border. But when you have to analyze if the cylinder uh, is worn, you have to measure more close to the middle. Or if you can use an uh, ultrasonic device to, uh, to read this or measure this, it's better. Uh, this was measured with an ultrasonic device. Uh, uh, something here that we we have to share is that once it reaches thirty percent of wear, you should check for possible fissures, crackings here, and please do not weld it because welding it can only create more more uh, more fissures, increase the size of the fissure here. And when it reaches fifty percent, you have to replace the cylinder. But you can see here that uh, this is a um, twenty-five millimeter thickness uh, uh, thickness uh, cylinder. So they were, no, Miguel, this still has more for 50. We still can work with what 50 is 12.5 centimeters uh, or millimeters, sorry. And then we can work with this one. So we should just uh, repair this one and recover the weight of this machine, uh, of this cylinder. But what happens here when you want to recover the, the, the weight? You first, you will have to go to the lower, the, the smallest one, the 17.4. 
So you will have to reduce the whole diameter of the cylinder to 17.4. This you have to take to a specialized mechanical workshop. They will have to reduce everything. And then you have to do some welding of additional plates in each side. So you will recover the weight it has lost due to normal wear because the cylinder is a wear part. Uh, usually not understand like that, known like that, but it's a wear part. So you will put these plates. The problem is that if you have a slight, very small difference during the welding, then you will have quite small difference in the weight or positioning and then you will have a different movement and eventually it will break. So in my experience, I have not seen anything work more than one month. Mm, it, doesn't ma it doesn't matter how much uh, expertise you have in welding, a mistake is possible always. And this difference or in the measurement during the welding or during the process of the trying to recover the cylinder will only create more expenses to you because you will have to pay for the repair and then pay for a new cylinder. So actually, if I, I would highly recommend to change the cylinder, don't think otherwise. So this is uh, this was soil compaction. So these were these are some tips and some information I would I would I wanted to share with you about soil compaction. Actually, this is uh, a bit longer when I, I do the training at the at the dealer or at the job site with the customer. Uh, but I have to summarize the m the most important points. Okay, so now we're moving uh, in the road construction. We are going to move to the next step. So I already compacted the soil. So now I have to put the asphalt and compact the asphalt. So we start with paving. So we're moving from putting all the compaction. We have already compacted the material. Uh, we have selected the right material machine for the material. And now we have uh, this little truck in front that will uh, spread some sort of glue, correct? Some sort of glue before we are going into paving. But of course, uh, I need some water, so I will leave you with a special uh, spreading machine we, we found here in South America. Sorry for that. Uh, uh, yeah, he is very skilled. You can see that uh, he is very skilled. So usually you should find a machine. There's a proper machine to do this, but you can find this also in the field. Uh, this was, was quite amusing. And I remember uh, there was someone from Germany looking at this also. <laughs> so we were doing this. Uh, I think this was my first paper commissioning, but actually this was good to know. Okay, so we have the soil compaction and now we spread uh, the glue and now we go to the next step. Of course, we will have our truck with the material and then what we actually recommend is we have a feeder so that the paper won't stop. So we have our feeders, of course, and we have our paving machine. And this paver could be a uh, Truck, uh, a crawler paper, no, or a wheel paper. Either of those depends on the application you're going to work with. Uh, one has more traction than the other, uh, so it actually depends more on, on what type of work you are going to work, you are going to do, what surface you are going to to work with. So, when we are talking about compaction, many times we forget about one special. Uh, point in the in the asphalt compaction. So, what is paving actually? When once you have the embankment and you have the sub base and the base, you are going to work with the asphalt. And yeah, <laughs> and when you are working with asphalt, then you what we usually recommend is like you should work with three layers: the base layer, the binding layer, and the surface layer. So. When we're working like this, uh, you can increase or you can improve the quality of the compaction or, or the layer or the surface, uh, the finishing of the surface that you are going to have. So, what's the first? What what's expected time of what we what would what would you expect for the lifetime of the paved roads? Actually, what we expect for it is like 
10 to 15 years in the wearing course and the surface layer. Then we have the binder course, 15 to 25 years, the base course to 40 to 50 years, and base or foundation 50 to 99 years. And this is theoretical. This is what you expect from the process of road paving. But actually, uh, this is more like our reality. Well, you can see I, I, you can see it very common in, in, in here in, in Latin American countries. Like they don't follow up that many recommendations when doing compaction or asphalt compaction paving. And then we can't find these sort of holes. Uh, this is a very well-known picture that we usually use in our trainings, and, and I really like it because it shows what actually is happening in the field. So how do we improve these irregularities? Uh, how to improve? This is something we have uh, shown in, in many trainings, of course, is that the foundation, you are just, you have compact the soil, but it doesn't mean it's a smooth uh, surface. It, ha it can have different levels of surface. So what you actually need is like uh, to create, uh, to improve this one. So how do you recover or how do you improve the level of the surface? You use the paper for this. So if you work in three layers, you will improve a lot more the smoothness and the leveling of the surface. So here, for example, you can see that just with a 10 centimeters uh, paving material, you have improved the difference from five centimeters from to one centimeter. If you are using automatic leveling system, of course. And then if you uh, do a second layer, the binder layer here would be, up, you can improve even more. You will have four centimeters up to two millimeters. So you are reducing this difference height in the material. And then you also have the top layer that sometimes they do or they do not make it. But even with that, you will just improve that much that it won't be that much difference. So um, for those of you that had the opportunity to come to Latin American countries, you may have felt that when you are driving, you have felt a lot of bumping in the car or in the truck you are driving. Uh, this bumping is due to the fact that we don't do this much in the, or this process is not very well used or could be known, but not used by the operators. And most of the time it's not the operator's lack of knowledge, is the responsible of the project concerned, like they want to use 10 centimeters of asphalt because the, we have someone that is going to audit our job and they are going to make sure that everywhere is 10 centimeters. If we have less than 10 centimeters, it's wrong. If we have more than 10 centimeters, it's wrong. So actually this is something that we are promoting. Uh, by the way, we are doing some, some several uh, talking with Dynapack about, we are going to do this event also in English. We have done it in Latin America. But in here, in those events, we promote this kind of working method so that customer and the guy is responsible of making the audit to the job field are aware that this is a better way to improve the surface of the finished surface of the material. Otherwise, you are just copying what you have in the soil. And if it's completely like waves, then you will have waves up uh, in the top part. So this part is quite important to, to, to check. And of course, uh, what we have also here is like um, give me one second, please. Okay. What we have here is like, what is alpha compaction, uh, asphalt compaction? What are we talking about when we are compacting asphalt? Well, what we were seeing before, it was like water. Remember when soil, it was water. When we're talking about asphalt, we change it by a binder. So the binder is going to be the one responsible of the lubrication in the material and to fill some of the gaps in the material. So asphalt compaction, asphalt compaction is quite similar to what we're going to see, but there we had, uh, the asphalt has to need some properties. The, it should have some properties. And with which properties do we need? We need stability, okay? We need the stability. Uh, so the material can sustain some load because it will sustain load depending of a high road, a uh, urban road, or where you are, you have different uh, load charges in the material. Um, these load charges are shown in the flexibility, of 
course it has to be flexible because it will deform but as well as it deforms it has to recover its form so it should have it should have a permanent deformation resistance so it can recover its form and of course durability we are uh, i showed before that how much do we expect this to to last but of course it could last i don't know less or more time depending on the job we do in the job site in the application we do uh, enough gaps to avoid bleeding here happens that when you use too much filler material in the asphalt then where i'm going to choose show what I'm talking to filler or filling material and of course the binder how much binder I'm using if I use too much binder or use or use too much uh, filler material then I will have uh, small uh, two uh, less air voids and by this when I start compacting the binder uh, the binder will come to the surface and uh, will move out of the material so then uh, when it cools down I will have a slippery surface and talking about the slippery surface that's what we need, sleep resistant. The, the, the reason we work with asphalt is because we want traction, so it cannot be a slippery. Uh, workable because we have to be able to use it in any surface, uh, in any conditions actually, because you can work uh, in a slope or when you are making a, a parking lot and it has some small slopes uh, to go up, go down, and you have to, it has to be workable. And uh, how is the composition of the asphalt defined? Well, as I was saying before, the, the, the asphalt is a mixture of materials. So here, what we have is like uh, different size of materials, different size of particles, and we have fillers and we have binder. So that percentage of, of mixture of this material is going to define the type of asphalt I'm going to have. So one value here that is very well known by us is like, for example, if I'm going to do a five centimeters layer, uh, thickness layer of material, uh, actually I should be able to place three, uh, one on top of each other, three particles of the biggest one, three of them, one, one on top of the other. And for example, for five centimeters, we are working with 16 millimeters. So the smaller the layer, we should have smaller particles, and the bigger the layer, we can have bigger particles. And when we're talking about Marshall method here, it was like Proctor method for soil, then we have the Marshall metal method for, uh, uh, for asphalt. And here, what we have is like, uh, for the material, we have a uh, weight, and we have a height, so we have uh, more energy actually than in soil to compact this one. And what we have to do is we are going to impact for or in, in both sides of the material. Then they are going to weigh this, they are going to let it cool, and then they are going to weigh this in, in water, suspended in water, then I'm going to weigh it uh, completely wet with water, and then I'm going to weigh it uh, completely dry and with this they are going to search for the specific gravity weight of the material um, then they will compare it in another slide i will show what how they do they compare the compaction degree but this material once you have this uh, and i will show you i will use this one because i have this piece of wood but you will actually have this piece of material like this and then you will place it like this in the machine so you start crushing it and when you start crushing it it will start it can be round, but then it will start oval. And what happens there? That you increase the load and it will move more and more oval until it breaks. When it breaks, that's the maximum load. You will measure the maximum load it can sustain. So the difference in, in, the, in, in this uh, height, it's called the flow. And uh, when it breaks, you will have the maximum load it can sustain, so you have the stability there. With these values, you with uh, what uh, I've been talking about, you will measure in, and you have density uh, b uh, b versus binder content. So what you are looking always is for the binder content you will need here. Actually, uh, the binder, the optimum binder content is almost always close to 6%, okay? But you can look into the density, air voids, stability, and ac actually I think, if not mistaken, 6% is one of the values that it's required in many of the projects when it's a government project and they make a trend uh, attending 
they will they will ask for this much uh, bitumen content or binder content but you can actually with this binder content you can um, create and calculate how much density you have to the material and a stability you have and with this tree you can make a quick formula math, some math and you will have the optimum binder content and it can vary yes because of the particles you are using okay so you you are using different particles you may have more or you may have less but this is how you make the asphalt and this is what the one you are going to compact in the end so one thing important about the asphalt also is how it comes because it comes from the asphalt plant you do the mix there but it has to live at certain temperature so actually when it leaves the plant could be around 160 degrees and but here is where it happens the composition the mixture of the materials of the size of the particles and the quantity of binder and then you have a segregation if you have the grid that they are using for the material it could be damaged it could, you could have some areas with bigger particles than the others uh, also when they leave because they prepare the material and they leave it at some one point and it comes a loader and put it back into the into the truck or of course they can also have this big con to the material goes directly to the truck but by this way it could actually cause some segregation so once it goes into the truck once again it could cause segregation because the filler the smaller particles could fall uh, in these air voids and you will have smaller particles at the end in, in the bottom of the, of the truck this could happen that shouldn't it doesn't mean it will happen always but this can happen in some degree and then you have the material temperature that arrives into the truck and then you have to the place place and time it means the location of the job site if it's too far from your location if it's too far from uh, the job site uh, you will need more trucks and one additional comment here is like when we're talking then for the paper you know um, F or an SD paper if not mistaken is 605 tons per hour but if you have a plant that is producing 120 tons per hour do you actually think that it's going to fit enough material for this then you will need lots of trucks in the middle so you are feeding constant material to the paper but if you don't have this one what do you do uh, one experience I had and it's important to mention is like uh, I was uh, here in South America of course and they were doing this uh, test of the paper and they had two trucks and of course I was asking and where's the job site uh, where's the plant it's 45 minutes from here and they were using only two trucks upon my concern they obtained one more truck but then during the test uh, it was very funny because the truck will we had three trucks with material they used one truck this one left for more material they used the second truck they hit left for more material and it used the third truck and it left for more material then i was waiting 30 more minutes for the next truck and the paper was there waiting and the material behind was uh, was already compacted and I was waiting so the machine can do a lot the machine can work with the correct feeding of material if you miss this point then you are uh, not using the most of the machine then when talking about paving when talking about the machine we are talking about thickness of the material of the of the, of the material we are going to use like five centimeters layer ten centimeters layer three centimeters layer depending on this we we have to understand and the width of the of the screen, we open it to 2.5 to 5 meters to 7 meters whatever meters we need and the quantity of material as I mentioned before we need constant feeding of material and we need some and here could happen some segregation and also the materials should arrive around 140 to 120 that's that I will highly recommend that because afterwards you are paving and the material seals go cooling down and if you don't have enough compaction materials then you can have some issues um, then of course something important here and why i'm starting with paper of uh, talking the much papers is like here you have the vibration and the tamper these are the two pre-compaction values that we will have at the beginning uh, so compaction of paving it includes the paper not only the rollers and then we're talking about the quantity of material we have in front of the discrete 
So if you you, you have to use the uh, Augur extensions, the the the, the tool and extensions, so you can have all the material, all the quantity of material, the correct quantity of material in front of the script. If you don't have that, you will have too much material, and the script can go up, or and then you will have some difference in the finishing height. And also, one factor to consider is the weather condition. If it's too cold, uh, it's snowing, raining, I don't know. You have to look into these factors also. And compaction, of course, you need to look into the type of roller. If you are going to use two, two drum roller, or if you're going to use a uh, pneumatic roller, uh, how much is the operating weight, the linear load, amplitude frequency, the rolling, and the number of passes, and the speed of the roller. And then uh, later I will show some slides with this information. Um, so who is the first responsible of compaction? Well, the paper. As I was mentioning before, the paper is the one that is going to start uh, the paving process. So this one is in the front. So here we have to be more concerned of the uh, how the truck is going to. Well, I don't have they don't didn't have a feeder here, but it's putting the material into the hopper and then the material is moved to the to the auger and finally to the street. And then in the back you have the two rollers waiting for it. So and actually this is the one project I remember that we were waiting. You can see there's only one truck there and that was the only one for the 40 minutes maybe. So. This is how you actually work. And so who is responsible for this compaction? It's a script. So you have to take a lot of attention in the quantity of the head of material you have here. You have to be aware of the angle of attack. Of course, this is related to the height of the material. So you have to be aware of what's happening in the script and how is the script. And you have to look into it all the time. And who, what levels of pre-compaction because this is one of recompaction that we're going to reach and this one depends on the type of script we're using depending on the type of script we're using we will reach different levels of pre-compaction and this is once again theoretical so this means that and you can read it pre-compaction from 65 to 70 percent only with vibration the more the one used more the tamper and vibration this is up to 88%. Uh, the newest one with high compaction, you have up to 96%. Once again, this is theoretical information. It depends a lot how well you take care of your machine. So we can reach these values. Yes, we can. But it depends on how we take care of the machine. So I'm using the tamper vibration machines because this is the um, ones we have the most in, in here in the, in the field. And the first one we have to look into is the tamper. So the tamper has this form, this profile. So actually the one doing the compaction, the pre-compaction here is the work of the tamper and uh, the plate of the screen. Of course, the tamper, only this area of contact is the going to be responsible. So when you usually look at the profile and it's worn, then you are not doing no compaction here. And what's here, look, in the profile, you can see here from below, you have all the area, the contact area, and then you have the plate area here, uh, the plate that is moving below the plate. So if you have this area of contact, you are doing some pre-compaction, but when you, it's completely worn, you have no profile. It doesn't matter if you have the tamper activator, because it, it's not making any compaction, you're using just the vibration. So actually here, uh, we will have a, a workshop tomorrow, uh, our global business development manager, Get Minich, is going to go into detail of not only these parts, but more parts in the paper. How do they affect in the compaction degree uh, and in the quality of the asphalt we are going to have? So the next one is the screen plate that it can show us, of course, what's going on in the field. So this is a new one. You can see that the screen here is quite new. It uh, could be 15 centimeters, 12 centimeters, uh, millimeters, sorry, or 12 or 18, doesn't matter which brand, it doesn't matter which machine, but you can see here actually that this is homo homogeneous. From here to there, you can have the same uh, thickness of material. So once you can see that it's worn in the back, you understand that there's something wrong in my application, something wrong they are doing, and you can fix it, you can do the recommendations. Uh, I won't go deeper into this because tomorrow we will have the workshop and Gerb will explain lots more of this. So 
Once we have done the paving, then we have reached a pre-compaction level. So we have the paver, we have pre-compacted the material, and then we have to use or a double drum roller, or we are going to use a pneumatic roller. So here uh, we can define if it's a double drum, as I mentioned, like the CC4200 or a CP2700 for the pneumatic roller. And uh, actually many times they ask me here in, in Latin America which one goes first. And this is an application issue. Uh, just to mention once again, it's like all the information I, I'm showing you is mostly of the experience I have with all my Latin American countries. Okay, I've visited them all and work with them. Uh, but one, one topic here that is valid to mention, I think it's very interesting to mention, is like you can see that in many places they use the pneumatic roller first. Okay, what we have found, uh, what we understand and we recommend actually, is you go with the double drum first. Because when using the vibration and the uh, force of impact, you will accommodate the particles and then you can uh, have a better level of compaction later when adding then the, the pneumatic rollers. When using first the pneumatic rollers, then you can only uh, you are just pressing them against each other. They they don't they don't vibrate. So you are pressing them against each other each other. So they won't reaccommodate or fill the gaps. They will just press against each other. So you you don't have the same behavior. So once again we have here the effect of the compaction time because we have to use or vibratory compaction or we have to use static, also known here like needing compaction. Uh, which one do we use? Okay. So actually. What I mentioned before, we use go first for the vibration compaction. So what do we use here? Uh, what do we, we questions do we have in the field? We have the, do we have to deactivate vibration when moving in reverse within compaction? The same as in soil rollers. You don't need to. You don't need to do this. Um, what is ABC? Well, that's automatic vibration control. And that's something good in these machines because you can activate vibration once it won't vibrate. It will vibrate when you reach 1.5 kilometers per hour and it will stop if you go lower than 1.5 kilometers per hour. So actually you activate vibration once and then you go forward and then you go backwards and then you don't take care about this. Uh, you don't have to take care if you activate or deactivate the vibration. Of course once where you're moving back the machine to the, to the truck and you are leaving the job site you should deactivate the vibration otherwise well, you will be vibrating everywhere. Um, should I change the amplitude when I change the compact direction, uh, compaction direction? No, you don't need to do this. Once again, uh, what, they, what usually happens in the field is the operator goes high, altitude, high amplitude until the machine starts jumping and they say, no, I have to do more, two, two passes more, then they go into low amplitude. Okay, so this one is quite, quite different. And can I vary the speed? It's a similar. You go five kilometers forward, five millimeters backwards. You don't need to go slower. I mentioned already this going slower, you might hit more than once the same spot. Uh, what I forgot to mention, and it's good to mention here, is like when you are in, in the asphalt, it's more easy to see when you are over compacting the material. What actually happens is that cylinder starts breaking the particles, and you will see a smooth, a smooth uh, white coloring in the surface. So then you know that you are breaking the particles. So actually what you have to do here is like, uh, I, I will explain a bit more about the amount of passes, but it could even happen with, with the paper. So this is something important. You have to check the uh, tamper level and the uh, vibration level in the paper. Uh, I remember I had this question or this meeting with a customer here like one month uh, ago and he was going in why can I not use at maximum tamper and maximum uh, vibration the discrete? Because it's not helping you. It's damaging the material. It's breaking everything apart. So he wanted to go maximum because the, ma the machine can go up to 3000 RPM, I think, or revolutions per minute for vibration and 1500 if not mistaken for tamper. So he wanted to go to the highest level because the machine can do it. Once again, it doesn't it's not important what the machine can do, it's what you should do in the field. So I have to do this because we are everyone in Sing Home, of course. I have to do this video conference and explain to him. And afterwards, the, the level of, of the quality of the surface of the asphalt improves a lot. Okay, so these are some values that you should 
take care of. Uh, of course, we can also find some technical information of the machine in the web page of Dynapack. Uh, which information you find is like the centrifugal force, no, once again. Uh, I'm not going to put the formula twice, but then you can see it. And you can have also the front module weight. And this is not only the front module, because you have front module and rear module are the same. So you will have the same weight. And then you have the width of the cylinder, and with this you of the of the drum, and you can this way calculate the static linear load. So you divide the weight with, by the width of the cylinder, and then you have the static linear load. Another value you will find, and you can look into it, is the surface capacity. So here we do not have the number of passes. Here we are not going to look in the number of passes, and why? As I mentioned before, the paver is the first responsible of pre-compaction. So we cannot go and say, yeah, we have this level of pre-compaction, uh, we can do two or three passes. It depends on how the machine is working. If the paper is too worn, then you won't reach the 88% of pre-compaction with a tamper vibration with screed. If the screed is too, it's going, if the pavering is going too slow, if the paper is going too fast, if you have not checked the other wear parts, then you will have some issues in the material. So then you will need more passes with the, the, with the asphalt roller, be it the double drum or the pneumatic roller. You will need them to make more, to work more, because that's why we don't have that kind of information here. So you need the first information coming from the paper, after the paper paved, then you will work with the cylinders. So here you can see the surface capacity. It means if I have calculated that I need only two passes additionally, I can cover this many square meters per hour. If I calculated two passes or four passes, six passes, I can estimate this quantity of tons of material per hour. So that's how can you calculate how much material you can uh, compact. But it doesn't mean the number of passes you have to make in the material. Uh, I don't know why is the video already there, but something very interesting here is that who is responsible for the compaction? In the case of the static or needing compaction is the weights here. You can see here the weights that are below. Of course, this is a CP1200. You have the CP2700 uh, or 2100 also, but the ones responsible are the weights you add divided and uh, this weight will be divided by the number of wheels you have so these ones are the ones making the work uh, making the job to compact the material uh, what is the best compaction speed here you have up to eight kilometers per hour then you work into work mode then you can go up to eight and back to eight uh, and now it shows again and this is one to one question we had before what is the best way to clean the tires you can see that there's no one and I mean, really, no one uh, controlling the machine and it's moving forward. Um, actually, uh, it's not to make uh, any fun of the brand because this is not the brand issue, it's like the operator's issue. Because when you want to clean them, but you usually, but you have a water, uh, uh, water tank, but you could also add some additive or glycerin, or you, 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 we, we have DynaGuard, of course, uh, we have products that can help to work with it and, 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 and clean the, 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 the tires, the wheels. But what they usually do is they use some uh, diesel to clean the wheels. And you can see that he just moved the machine backwards. Uh, now we can see that he is going backwards, uh, could the rear part of the machine. And he had in his hand a small bottle of diesel. So besides being very dangerous what he's doing, this is what we can see actually in the field is you have the operator at top controlling the machine and then you have this guy following behind uh, adding some diesel to the wheels so that material won't stick to the wheels okay this is uh, not what you should be doing of course this is not what we recommend but this is what you can find this was shared by one of our distributors that was doing some machine commissioning and he was waiting the permission to enter to the job site so he was he's recording this from his car uh, we of course have the compaction information also 
the surface capacity again. Once again, if you don't know, if you don't know what the paving compact after the paving uh, co compaction, let's say the the, the the degree of compaction you sh you are shift with the paper, you don't know how many passes you have to make. So the, we can share how much uh, we can compact if we're doing two, four, six, eight, or ten passes. Um, and then we have something that is also n not new, but is very used among us, uh, among our customers nowadays, is the combi roller, where you have a smooth cylinder on the front and you have uh, wheels in the back. And who is responsible for the compaction? Well, both, of course. Each one is do first the cylinder or the drum will vibrate and compact the material with amplitude and frequency. And then in the back, in the back side, you have in the rear part, you have the wheels that will seal the material. Uh, should I de deactivate? No, you don't need to deactivate the vibration. Once again, comes with ABC. Yes, it comes with ABC. Can I vary the speed? No. Once again, you should work with the maximum speed uh, in forward and reverse. But one, one part that it's important to mention because this is this made me remember something that. The CC machines has the option of only one uh, vibration in one cylinder and in often in the front cylinder. Well, it's in the front cylinder, not often. It's in the front cylinder because um, what usually happens here is that you can do this. Yes, of course. But what we would recommend is like to be very careful with this uh, application. What I found sometimes in the field is like when they stop the machine, they, they think, no, this part is, it has not been compacted correctly. So they use the machine, uh, with the machine stopped, okay, they start vibrating. So vibrating with the machine stop will only harm the, the drum. So yeah, you can use this uh, one cylinder vibration, but you have to be careful when you do it or under which application you do this one. And of course, you have technical data, and you have a mixture here of information because you will have the centrifugal force that belongs to the cylinder, and then you have the mass module for the cylinder, and you will have for the rear part of the machine. And if you divide, of course, the front mass module by the width of the drum, then you will have the static linear load. And if you divide the rear weight of the machine by the number of wheels, you will have the wheel load. So this information is important so you understand what, what, do we, what information do we have. Of course, you have more information on the web page, but like the engine, uh, another technical info, but this is the info that you usually work with. Uh, when we talk about compaction degree in asphalt, uh, usually you will use this core drill, you will take a sample and then you will take it to the lab and then you will measure it dry, measure it in water and measure it, it suspended in water uh, and measure it in wet, uh, uh, wet, okay? And then you will have the a specific gravity of the compacted asphalt and based on the Marshall test and the Marshall uh, test we did at the beginning or the with the Marshall method, we have the specific gravity, we, the highest we can achieve with the asphalt. So then comparing both, again, like in the soil compaction, you will have the compaction degree you have a shift with the material. Um, here, important to mention, like uh, you can also have the nuclear device that can do it, okay? And well, the, the core uh, drill, actually, uh, you can see that you have bigger particles in the lower part and then you have the smaller particles and then smaller ones. So this is actually how it should look like when you are doing some paving in the field. So finally, what is the number of passes? You need to know what's the compaction degree needed for the project. Once again, for urban roads, maybe you need 95% compaction because it's only cars. You know, are not having big trucks going through the streets so it won't affect the material and then of course you have uh, trucks that you need for higher roads uh, high roads and then you will need 98 or 100 percent of degree of compaction or you go to airport and you need 100 percent of uh, compaction degree 
Uh, then, of course, you need to make field tests when talking about papers. Uh, rollers, you have to do it in, in, in two steps, otherwise you are going to miss some information here from the field. Um, each pass should be measured and registered so that uh, in the end you have an average quantity of passes that you can control and with this you can do a, bet, uh, a better calculation or estimation of the number of passes. So in overall this was almost all the information I had to share with you. It took me almost one hour and a half so now we're going to move for the questions and answers sections and if you have questions uh, additional to the ones you already left in the chat box please leave more comments there and we will go there so So we're moving with Eduardo. Hi Eduardo, everybody is seeing you in YouTube by the way, so please behave. <laughs> um, yep, um, well I think uh, we have uh, some questions at the beginning. Um, what is the productive method to reduce the moisture effectively, effectively in the job site? <sighs> Well, actually, this is some material that should come from the lab. This material usually comes prepared from the lab. So what they usually do is that they know how long they are going to stay. They they know it will stay for one, two, three hours. Uh, this way, you can know what uh, what is the quantity of material or, or the humid, uh, the moisture content you will have after a few hours. So then you will compact compact the material. Of course, you can control it by manually, li like, like I showed before, like with so. taking a sample with your hand and letting it fall, and it will give you in, uh, in the field an idea of how much uh, moisture level you have. And then you have some tests that you usually do in the lab. They take this sample and they use this bottle and they start moving it around like centrifugal force. Not able to hear me? Hear me or hear Eduardo? I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah, if you hear me, they should be able to hear me. So please let me know if you are hearing me or not. Because I've been, eh, maybe it was when I was talking with you, Eduardo, to, to let you join the, the meeting. Um, that's, uh, that's mainly it. So um, that's something that usually you can do in the field. They, they have, sometimes they have some labs and they use this bottle to make this, I was oh. saying, like centrifugal force and then they will remove the water of it, they will have some oil sample and they will know how much uh, moisture level they have and they will say, no, you can use the material, or oh, no, you have to take it, add some water to reach the, the moisture level. Mm, don't, don't know, uh, well, what else do we have here? Which machine was used in sandy soil on road project? Well, I think I already answered that one. Uh, smooth drums, one pass is moving from one pain point A to B and B to A. Yes, that's correct. You move from point A to point B, then from point B to point A, and that's one pass. Uh, the vibration is on and in return is off. No, you leave the vibration on at all time. At all time. Uh, does different soil have different vibrations? Is there any scale? Does this does different soil have different vibration? Is there any scale? I don't quite understand. I, I maybe I understand because if the you're talking about the bouncing effect, uh, Bikram, I would really appreciate if you could provide us more information. Or maybe you, Eduardo, you have? Do you understand uh, the question? Maybe you have the answer for it. 
No, this is not really clear what uh, he means with uh, by soil vibration. Okay. I don't really get it. Okay, so I don't know, Eduardo. Uh, I think you heard part of the presentation. That you don't have any more additional comments or more information you would like to add to what I have been uh, presenting in, in, in the in this workshop. Yeah, I took the last part of the presentation. Uh, I think it was a very good presentation, Miguel. I have no remarks or questions on that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, as I was saying bef uh, before during the meeting, please uh, do leave your questions on the on the chat box there. Uh, also, if you think um, Remember that tomorrow we are going to have a workshop and we are going to talk about papers. Okay, then it will complement the part I was talking about the paper in the asphalt paving or in the asphalt compaction. The first responsible one is the paper. So if we do not take care of the paper correctly, then we are not having enough pre compaction and therefore we will need more passes with the roller. So having more passes with the roller uh, is needed. If you are taking care of your paper, then you just need. Um, few passes with the roller. Yeah, now we have another question there, Miguel. Yep. Um, high amplitudes are always used in initial passes. Why don't we have vibrations in PTR machines? PTR is pneumatic roller, sir, correct? Mm -hmm, uh, yes. And we have to switch off the operation in Herpin Burn Road. Help me to understand this last one question, Eduardo. Hairpin is a tight band, I would say. Uh, when it's very close, when it's turning quite close? Yeah, when they have to turn the machine uh, in a sharp turn, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will try to answer all of them. Uh, let's see. High amplitudes are always used in initial passes. Yeah, actually what I've seen is that they usually use high amplitude until the vibration uh, the machine cannot control the vibration. It, it means that the bouncing effect is so much strong that uh, the operator feels like the machine is jumping. So when the, they lose some sense of direction, the direction moves by itself. They stop using high vibration and they mo use uh, low vibration if they uh, still have some passes to do. Uh, depending, of course, in the uh, depth of the material, you could work all the time with uh, low vibration and then you will need more passes maybe to achieve the uh, degree of compaction you need. Um, the going to the second uh, question, when why do we don't have vibrations in PTR machines, is these are static machines. So we use no. the weight of the machine to reach the compaction degree. So we don't use vibration in these ones. Okay. Uh, what we have is the combi version where you have the smooth uh, cylinder in the front that vibrates and in the back part you have the the wheels but this is a completely different application um, and I don't know if that answered your question or not but I, I, I have seen no motives to have vibration in a static machine that is going to work with the weight of the machine and uh, remember that weight you are adding to a PTR machine it's uh, you can have metallic ballasts and then you will add sand and even water to reach the highest uh, weight for the machine and in this way you can compact with the weight the total weight of the machine and do we have to switch off the vibration in hairpin burn road no i don't think so i have in all the field uh, job sites i've been they vibrate all time even in in, in, in hairpin burn road um i don't know if you have more comments on this eduardo well on this what i have seen is that uh, as much as possible the operators try to avoid to make a sharp uh, turn with the machine so they move forward and backwards to make the complete uh, bend they go forward and back more times and then th they don't have to turn too much the machine and then by that they can avoid some kind of uh, damage on the, the asphalt mm. okay so uh, I don't know if that uh, answer all your questions. If you have more questions, please uh, let us know. Um, yeah, that was uh, 
quite interesting meeting we had today. I hope you got most information. It's it was quite long. Actually, they expected to be a two hours uh, workshop, but it was already for me one and a half hours was quite long. Uh, hopefully, in a future meeting, we will have only soil and other date, only asphalt. But I don't know. I, we have another of these meetings for next week. Is uh, then we have a new question here. Is there any parameter guideline mix? of soil with sand more suitable with application tamping unit mm. actually this is uh, you're talking about the mix of the material when when you have more than 35 percent if not mistaken of the clay content or seal content you should go up to a tamping unit if you have less than that then you can go into the soil or a uh, smooth uh, cylinder roller. Um, that's actually one of the values you can use for 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 it. Um, I don't know if you can add to something to that, uh, Eduardo. No, that's it, Miguel. It's more for clay applications, of course, the, the tamping machines. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, actually, I remember that uh, the higher the quantity of clay and seal, then you are mm -hmm. going with tamping unit. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are talking about mixture of soil, actually, you sometimes they uh, they actually add some clay to it because it works like a filler uh, in the material. So while you don't go more than a quantity of material, then you will you can work with. Uh, with a smooth roller, if you go to too much clay and seal, then you are talking about a cohesive material, and you will need a tamping unit. So, oh, thank you very much, Eduardo, for joining. I know you were in a meeting and you had to be quite puff, quite fast, but thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Miguel. Very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you to everyone that part has participated for this meeting. Uh, please leave your questions there. Um, well, you can see, you can find my email below there also, if you need questions. Oh, of course, you can send it to Eduardo. Uh, that's better for me <laughs> if you send it to Eduardo. And um, of course, um, any information you need, um, you can ask us and we will help you uh, as much as possible. And I try to share this application training because it's been a long time since we have some application information uh, from uh, from all, all, all of us. So I try to join all the experience we had here in Latin American countries and share them with you. Um, hopefully it has covered most of the questions of most of the information uh, you sometimes miss when, when you are not going that frequently to the field. And, um, well, thank you to all for your participation. Eduardo, I don't see any more questions. I don't know if you have any questions, Eduardo, because you joined her uh, later. And if anyone needs anything additional, well, we can sum it up and close it. So I will give you maybe one more minute for any additional questions. So important, once again, um, Tomorrow we will continue with uh, another, this is an aftermarket presentation actually, not a marketing presentation. We go more into the field experiences we have. And tomorrow we are going to have a workshop with Gerd, who is going to talk about the papers. And this again is the aftermarket presentation we're doing. Um, we're using YouTube by the way, because this is a way we can use the highest quality of uh, possible to show a presentation and show videos and um, there's a buffering time of one minute between what we are talking and what you see so uh, I think if you like it please leave your comments there send me an email um, we will be aware if you like this material how you like it and what we can do also to improve this okay so Eduardo I don't see any more questions uh, thank mm. you for joining us uh, thank you for your time thank you all for the time you have placed for this uh, training um, see you soon in the next training thank you thank bye you. bye bye bye
The story of Dynapack begins in 1934 with the foundation of AB Vibro Beton, a company specialized in vibration technologies. Since then, product development has been one of our main focus areas. It enabled us to develop the world's first self-propelled compactor. Decades later, this machine has evolved into a sixth-generation family of rollers that still leads the field. In 1973, we changed our name to Dynapack, short for Dynamic Compaction, turning our reputation into a strong and committed brand. Over the years, our pavers, material feeders and other machines also became known for their reliability and performance. Equipped with Dynapack innovations, our machines enable customers around the world to achieve better results. Advanced machine technologies combined with digital solutions increase uptime and ensure the highest quality and efficiency. Strategically located production units and distribution centers, as well as a global sales and service network, provide the assurance of Dynapack support in more than 150 countries. And yet, our story still isn't finished. Under the wings of Fiat, our next chapter begins. We have a new visual identity with colors that express the spirit of Dynapack and our passion for innovation. An identity that signals our independence as a brand with our own technologies and products and dedicated Dynapack channels focused on helping our customers. Innovation is fundamental to the Fiat strategy. As part of a group with extensive knowledge on road construction equipment and the ambition to be a technology leader, we can create better solutions for the challenges our customers face. Within the Fiat group, we can achieve development and sourcing synergies to strengthen our own engineering and production capabilities. This will enable us to extend our offer with new products, services and digital solutions. Like Dynapack, Fiat knows that great support is the key to customer loyalty. So we'll seize this opportunity to build and focus our service organization, ensuring our customers always come first. In short, the road equipment division of the Fiat Group provides us the framework and stability that will allow us to innovate and grow. A bright new chapter that will enable us to be a reliable partner who helps its customers pave the way to success. A promising future for the continuing story of Dynapack. Dynapack, your partner on the road ahead. The story of Dynapack begins in 1934 with the foundation of AB Vibro Beton, a company specialized in vibration technologies. Since then, product development has been one of our main focus areas. It enabled us to develop the world's first self-propelled